in the holy name of Jesus. You guys watch movies, right? You've seen a movie. Who doesn't watch movies? We all watch movies. That's what we do. You ever watch a thriller movie, though? You like a good thriller, a good suspense, action-packed. You know those movies that keep you on the edge of your seat, constantly wondering what's going to happen next? You ever watch those movies? That's a certain draw for some people, I'd say. Maybe it's not for everyone. But if you like that movie, it's usually because of the emotions it gets up. You know, it's just so exciting. Thriller is just one genre of movies, and there's actually many sub-genres. You can split up thrillers and talk about what kind we're talking about. We've got the crime investigation thriller. That'd be something like The Fugitive with Harrison Ford. You've got the spy thriller. That'd be any of the Mission Impossibles. You've got uh, even the religious thriller, believe it or not. That'd be something like Angels and Demons. But my question is, what makes a thriller a thriller? How could Angels and Demons have anything in common with, say, Mission Impossible? I think it has to do with your relationship to the movie. How it is that the audience member plays into the movie. Because in a thriller movie, you're thrown into the middle of it with the characters. It's almost like you're solving the mystery right along with them. You're right into the middle of the action because some of the key information that would be in other movies is left out, right? There's no scene where you see what the bad guy is doing and you're like, oh, watch out, he's going to do that, he's going to do that to you. No. When it happens, it happens and that's when you'll know. You're wondering what's going to happen, you're thrown into the middle of it. You're out of the know. But I have a suspicion, guys, that though we like to watch a thriller, though we like to see a mystery, though we like to, the suspense, the only time we actually like being out of the know is when we're sitting in front of the TV screen, right? Because we know that once the movie's over, we can get up and we can leave, right? We like the suspense, we like the thrill for a couple hours because we know that whether the main character lives or dies, whether he solves the mystery or is duped, whether he achieves his dreams or they're crushed, whether he finds love or not, we can have our emotions back at the end. We can go on our way. Everything's okay. We don't seek out that thrill all the time. We can handle two hours of stress. A good story has a beginning, it has a middle, and it has an end, right? You learn this in literature class, right? And if you're paying any attention in literature class, especially during the storytelling unit, you know that it's at the beginning of the middle that some sort of conflict comes out, right? That's what makes a good story. The middle is a little tenuous, it's a little uncertain. You're in a little bit of limbo wondering what's going to happen. It's in these conflicts and it's in these resolutions that make a good story. But I'm going to say, guys, that that's good for stories, not necessarily what we look for in real life. We don't look for middles in real life. We don't look for the thriller in real life where there's life or death situations. We don't seek those out. We try to avoid them. If something has the possibility of ruining your life, good rule of thumb is stay away. The ideal story goes something like this, guys. The beginning is the princess meets the prince. They fall in love. That's the beginning. Skip over that part. Come to the end. They get married and they live happily ever after. Don't tell me about any wicked witch. Don't tell me about any evil queen. Don't tell me about a foul stepmother. I'll speak for myself and say, middles are no good. We can handle it for two hours, and you might even say it's cathartic in a movie just to experience that stress for, for two hours. But what about when your life feels like you're in the middle of a Hollywood thriller? And it's not two hours, but it's weeks or months or even years for some. We have middles, guys, in our lives. There's no doubt about that. You know what it feels like. It's when you're sick or someone you love is sick, and you ask... And, so, and somebody asks you, how's it going? How you doing? And all you can really say is, well, I don't know. I'm in the middle of it right now. 
I mean, I'm alive, but I can't really tell you how this is going to play out. It's when you have a relationship that maybe you really biffed it on, or maybe somebody else ruined it. Somebody asks you, well, how, how are you and so-and-so doing? And you're like, I don't know. We're trying to pick up the pieces right now, but we're in the middle of it, and I don't know how it's going to end. It's when you're in physical therapy or in rehab, and somebody asks how you're doing, and all you can say is, I don't know. I'm in the middle of it. I might make a full recovery, but at the same time, I might not ever be able to move the way I used to be able to move. You can be in the middle of it when you're trying to make a big, important life decision and the, the future seems unclear. You can't tell which way to go. Or maybe you're in the middle of a soul-sucking job that you worry you might be stuck in for the rest of your life. There's no clear way out. No clear future ahead. Middles stink. There's no doubt about that. All we want is these middles to come to some sort of good ending. We find ourselves today looking at our gospel reading, Matthew chapter 4. And we don't find Jesus in the middle of his ministry, but actually we find him at the beginning. And boy, does it look good right off the bat. Why? Because we see Jesus Coming to, the pe coming to people in the middles, the middle portions of their lives, and he takes them and he pulls them out of their middle and brings them to a good ending where they're supposed to be, where life is supposed to be. It looks good. We see him calling simple fishermen a simple job to a better job of being his disciples, living like him. We see him coming to people who are in the middle of sickness, the uncertainty of it all, giving them the certainty of his healing. People in the middle of demon possession, he saves them from their oppression, he gives them a future. And people in the middle of sin, he calls to repentance, to a new life, a way forward. This is what Jesus does, and I think when we look at his whole ministry in general, we can see that you can summarize it with this, with the, the beginning. It's what the whole ministry looks like. Him coming to people in the middle of problems. Problems not his own. And him pulling them out to a good and gracious end. But what you might notice from the beginning of Jesus' ministry. What might not be so clear as he's pulling people out. Is that as he is getting them out of their middles. He ends up wading deeper into a middle of his own. We're not yet at the part of Jesus' life which most looks like a thriller. But it doesn't take long for us to get there. And that's because it doesn't take long for his enemies, for the Pharisees, for the authorities to see what he's doing. And they don't like it. They don't like it one bit. And so we find ourselves in a thriller, actually, guys. It's subtle at first. It's subtle. A whisper here, a whisper there. Who is this man to forgive another his sins? Is he blaspheming? Or look at his disciples over there, not doing what's lawful on the Sabbath. And it moves from whispers to outright propaganda. They say for everyone to hear, that man casts out demons by the power of Satan. That's what he's doing. They lay traps for him. They question him. They watch his every move. Also, that they might achieve their main goal, which is to destroy him. We're in a thriller, guys. Jesus' life is full of suspense. You wonder, is he going to elude the authorities? Are they going to catch him? Will he outsmart them? What will happen with this Jesus? And everything seems to be going good, right, as we go through, especially at the beginning. And even in the middle, things seem, though tenuous, that they're going in the right direction. His fame spreads throughout the land. People are following him, seeking after this strange rabbi. He confounds the Pharisees at every turn and he continues his ministry that can be called grabbing people out of their middle and bringing them to a good end. It all kind of culminates on Palm Sunday, right? When he rides into Jerusalem on a donkey and you say, this guy looks a whole lot like a king and the crowd seem to agree with you. Hosanna to the son of David, they say. And you think maybe he'll be victorious. 
But things take a, take a turn for the worst as the conflict comes to a head with, with the authorities and Jesus. That very week, Palm Sunday, they arrest him and they, they charge him with blasphemy. That's a capital offense. And if Jesus wasn't in the middle of it before, he sure is now. It's at this point in the Hollywood thriller where you see the character fighting with all his life, fighting for his life, you might say, to escape. But we see Jesus remaining silent. He takes it. What are you doing, Jesus? You're tempted to yell. You ever yell at the TV? What are you doing, Jesus? You never let anyone else lose when they were in the middle. Don't give up now. But he remained silent. <coughs> they beat him. They make him carry his cross. He's crucified. And he dies. And he is buried. And it's at this point... I know I said that you could have your emotions back at the end of a thriller, but it's at this point where I'm thinking, I'd like my ticket refunded if this is the way that the story ends. Can you imagine what his disciples must have thought? Spent three years with this guy. He can't really be dead, can he? It wasn't supposed to end this way. But he is dead. But that's not how the story ends. You guys know. Because that's not the real ending. That's a fake ending that only looks like the ending. Because in, in a dramatic twist of events that we couldn't have seen coming, Jesus rises from the dead in ultimate victory over all of his enemies. How? Well, it's because this rabbi we've been following around happens to be the very son of God. Turns out his mission was not just for the people he met on this earth, but his mission was to take all middles and bring them to a good and gracious ending forever and ever. Amen. That was his goal. And when you see what his goal was, and when you see who he is, what he says starts to make more sense. He said, in my father's house there are many rooms. Rooms for you. He said, whoever believes in me, even if he die, yet shall he live. He said that for you. And he promised to come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, to bring forth his kingdom, which will have no end, a kingdom that you will be a part of, a kingdom in which everything will be good and new and right. And the cool part about it is that this is a better ending than I could have thought of, better ending than anyone could have thought of. And it's an ending that's for you. We have middles in our lives, guys. There's no doubt about it. Times of stress, times of anxiety, times of conflict and hardship. The future doesn't always look so certain when you look out there in the middle of it. And so you pray. Like we pray in the Lord's Prayer. I promise I'm bringing it around. <laughs> Give us this day our daily bread, Lord, the things that we need. Forgive me. Save me from temptation. Save me from evil. And it still can look so uncertain. You wonder, will God really give me what I need? Will he really forgive me? Will he really save me from the sin and from the evil that I'm facing? Because when you look around, it sure seems like there's a fog covering the future. You can't see through it. The end is not in sight. But brothers and sisters, that's why we end the Lord's Prayer the way we do. That's why we say, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. When you're in the middle of it, when you can't see what the future holds, look to the cross. Look to the empty tomb. That is the place where Jesus took all middles and brought them to a gracious ending forever. When you're in the middle of it, when you can't see the future, Remember who it is that you are praying to. You say, our Father. But not just our Father, the one who's in heaven. The one to whom belongs the kingdom. The one who has all power. The one who has all glory. The one who is more than able to do what is necessary for you. The one who raised our Lord Jesus Christ 
from the dead. That's what he did for you. God wants what's best for you. He wants to give you what you need. He wants to forgive you. He wants to save you from sin and evil. He loves you. But it's not just that he loves you, guys. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever means that he can do what he promises for you. And here's the good news. He hasn't left you in the dark wondering what the future might hold, but he's given you the game plan, how things are going to go on from here on forward. You don't have to worry when you're in the middle of it because this life is not a thriller. You know how it's going to play out. Just as Jesus rose from the dead, you too shall rise to newness of life. Why should the middles get your heart pumping so fast? For you know that just as God has said, Jesus will come again in glory to bring his kingdom, which will have no end. Kingdom for you. A kingdom in which all the middles will finally be brought to the ending that he has promised. Amen.